President Miller Fillmore got a late start on his education, and Abigail Powers got an early start on her teaching career. Then the student and the teacher got married. I'm Bob Summers, and this is a presidential story. Millard Fillmore was born in 1800 in a log cabin to a poor family. Instead of going to school, he worked on the family farm until he was 14, when he took an apprenticeship with a cloth maker. Unhappy he was relegated to only the manual labor, he left the apprenticeship to work in a mill. Still, Fillmore wanted more for himself. He purchased a membership in a circulating library and read all the books he could. When he was 19, he took advantage of the downtime at the mill and enrolled in a new academy in town. It was there he met Abigail Powers. Abigail was born two years before Millard. When she was two, her father, a minister, passed away, but he left behind an extensive library of books. Her mother was a school teacher and used these books to educate Abigail. Abigail became a great fan of literature, but she was also proficient in math, government, history, philosophy, and geography. By the age of 16, Abigail became a teacher, which makes her the first first lady to pursue a career. While teaching, she also continued learning, including speaking French and playing the piano. After teaching at a couple of different schools, she landed at the private New Hope Academy, where she met a promising student in Millard Fillmore. Millard and Abigail connected over their shared love of learning and started dating. This is not as scandalous as it would be today, mainly because they were close in age. In 1819, they became engaged, although they did not marry immediately. Millard wanted a better life for himself as well as for Abigail, so they remained engaged for seven years until he had a steady job as an attorney. Tradition, and sometimes laws at the time, stated that women would resign their jobs after marriage, and certainly after having children. Even after the birth of their son, Millard Powers Fillmore, in 1828, and their daughter, Mary Abigail Fillmore, in 1832, Abigail did not resign from teaching. In fact, she became even more involved in her community. After Millard helped establish the city of Buffalo, New York, Abigail was responsible for the construction of Buffalo's first public library, and this wasn't the last library she would start. When the Fillmores moved into the White House, Abigail was appalled that there was no library. Previous presidents brought their own libraries, but then took the books with them when they left. The Fillmores decided that a library was a necessary fixture in the White House, as Abigail was accustomed to having books in the home, and Miller depended on reference books in his work as president. As one might imagine, Mrs. Fillmore preferred reading to parties. She had broken her ankle many years before and it had not healed properly, making it painful to stand in receiving lines for hours to greet guests. So, she let her daughter take on those responsibilities while she spent her time lobbying Congress for funds for a White House library. With an approved congressional appropriation of $2,000, or about $70,000 today, Abigail converted the Oval Room in the White House into the White House Library. Abigail personally curated, organized, and decorated the library, and whenever new books arrived, she would personally place the books in their proper spot. As First Lady, she would invite famous contemporary writers like Washington Irving and Charles Dickens to meet her in the new White House Library. This literary salon is just one example of why she is ranked as one of the most intellectual First Ladies in early American history. With this intellect, Millard valued her opinion on all important decisions. Unfortunately for him, he did not always follow her wise counsel. In accounts of the day, it is said Millard asked her if he should sign the controversial Fugitive Slave Act. Abigail said no, telling him he would not be nominated for a second term if he did. He did sign the act, and like she predicted, on the 53rd ballot, Millard lost the 1852 Whig nomination for president to General Winfield Scott. After Franklin Pierce defeated General Scott, Abigail stayed with her husband during Pierce's outdoor inauguration despite the cold wind and snow. She returned chilled to her Washington, D.C. hotel, where she developed bronchitis that progressed into pneumonia. She died on March 30, 1853, less than one month after her husband left office the shortest post-White House tenure of any First Lady. Thanks for watching.